of the co-facilitators of this policy network, and I always forget to tell him about the recording. I'm so sorry. We are going to start. Um, so we are uh, here with the third thematic webinar um, of the policy network, Internet Fragmentation, this year. Um, and as I said, I'm one of the co-facilitators of the policy network. Um, Bruna is also um, here. Uh, Bruna, do you want to say hi? Yes, of course. Thanks, Chital. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the call. Happy to see the third one happening with um, a high number of participants. So very, very glad to see everybody here. Thanks, Bruna. And Wim as well. And apologies again for not um, uh, letting you know that we're starting. <laughs> it's forgiven. So hi, all. Uh... For me, I'm uh, Wim Dijsel, I'm consultant uh, with the Secretariat supporting the policy network and also very happy to see the high number of uh, participants uh, in the room and uh, looking forward to have this uh, interesting discussion. Certainly, thanks, thanks Wim. Um, and likewise, it's really great to see so many of you on this on this call. Um, we just wanted to do a quick intro to or background to the policy network and where we um, have come from, um, because as I said, this is a third thematic webinar uh, for those of you who haven't joined us for the others. So apologies if you know all of this already, but for those who may be a bit newer, we hope this is helpful. And then um, as with the other webinars, we're going to have two discussants um, today. Um, Maria from the IAB, the Internet Architect Bo Architecture Board, um, and Ola from ISOC, and I hope that you can do um, intros for yourselves if that's okay, because I know you wear many hats, um, and I didn't, I didn't want to do you a disservice. So um, we'll turn to you after the brief intro, and we will be answering some questions that um, are very similar uh, to the other two thematic webinars, but are uh, focused on the technical layer, which is what we're here to discuss today. So Wim, um, as you can see, that's the agenda. Yeah, thanks. Just to, by way of background, uh, the policy network um, is in its second year. And as you can see on the screen, our, our aim um, as an intersessional work stream of the IGF is to engage in discussions on and raise awareness of the measures and actions, technical, policy, legal, and regulatory that pose a risk to the open internet. And, and as you can see there, we've been working um, on, on unpacking um, and understanding what internet fragmentation is. Um, and the understanding is, is something that we um, were aiming to do with these webinars, go deeper into the framework we, we um, developed last year, which will be on the next slide. Um, and the aim is also to collect and analyze case studies, specific examples of fragmentation, each of the areas of the framework, um, and um, and establish some, some shared principles or recommendations or something, um, some recommendations um, for, for stakeholders uh, to address internet fragmentation. So we are um, really uh, doing, as part of that effort, these webinars to further unpack the framework um, that was developed last year, which um, I think is in on the next slide. Um, and I'm sure many of you on this call will be familiar with it. Um, you can see the, the bucket, um, as we sometimes refer to it, relating to the technical layer. That's the discussion we'll be having here. Um, and we have some specific questions about what it means and what internet fragmentation in, relate, in relation to the technical layer actually means um, and what um, can be done about it. So we're, as I said, hoping um, to just dig deeper into that discussion. Um, the report from last year, I can put it into the chat. Um, so this is springboard for that, but here we really want to get deeper into that discussion. Um, so for the next um, the next slide, I think we have the, the questions that will allow us to get deeper into the unpacking of that um, of that bucket, um, technical layer fragmentation. Um, 
And um, for those of you who have been to the other um, webinars, as you'll know, we followed the same format um, in terms of uh, having these questions, what, what is it? Um, what examples are there? What are the examples that pose the highest risk and what can be done? Um, so we're hoping that with this consistent approach to the unpacking of the different elements of the framework, the conceptualization of frag internet fragmentation, that we can um, develop something practical and um, useful for the wider community. Um, from these from these discussions, um, and we'll be develop uh, the, the recordings of the other two are available, um, and we'll be of course after this one discussing how we best um, move forward with the with the outcomes of these discussions. But without further ado, we'll we'll um, we'll come on to the the discussion we're here to have today on technical layer fragmentation. As I said, we have two great discussants who are here to help get our um, intellectual juices flowing and thinking, um, pointing us in some directions to think about these questions. Um, we have, um, as I said, um, Olaf um, from the Internet Society. So I'm gonna start with you. And Olaf, please do feel free to introduce yourself in however way, whichever way you want to. Um, and you have about five minutes um, to help orient us uh, with regards to these questions. Thank you. Five minutes, quite a challenge. Uh, my name is Olaf Kollerman. I'm a principal of Internet Technology Policy and Advocacy in the uh, Internet Society. And I have uh, somewhat of a background of working in uh, in the internet infrastructure. I started at the RIPE NCC, uh, which most of you will know uh, as, a, as an organization that's coordinating um, internet resources and uh, has a role in internet governance and uh, address policy setting. And I continued a lot of my work in uh, in the ITF and uh, on the DNS, and now uh, I'm working on more you know, general matters. The unpacking prioritization and addressing are three questions that I'm going to answer with one, I would say, tool. Um, we have been looking at, uh, at, at, at the question of fragmentation and what impacts the internet uh, at the internet society already for a very, very long time. Uh, some might uh, uh, remember a document that we created a long time ago called the Internet uh, Invariance. Um, and that document has uh, uh, seen a, a evolution um, into a, a more comprehensive uh, I would say toolbox, uh, which we call uh, the Internet Way of Networking uh, 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 Assessment Kit, so to speak. Well, the Internet Way of Networking is is uh, a set of uh, of critical properties that defines what is needed to be able to internet work, internet work with a capital I. To have a global network, to have global connectivity, um, and and to to be connected uh, globally, it's it's the properties of this 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 what we call the internet, and and how we got there, in um, almost technology neutral terms, and we have identified five critical properties: um, accessible infrastructure with a common protocol. Accessible means you can join and become part of it without barriers. Um, and of course, the common protocol means uh, it's basically IP. Um, uh, uh, the ability to, to, to easily interoperate in, uh, without, without adding too much complexity. Of course, that complexity has been added. Um, in that sense, one could say internet is already a little bit fragmented by IPv4 and IPv6. It was a conscious thing. Conscious development, maybe, maybe, Mary, I will talk a little bit about that. I don't know. Um, uh, in order to get to a situation in the future where, again, we have a common protocol. Second critical property, open architecture of interoperable and reusable building blocks. There is no big blueprint of the internet. It's building blocks that are uh, put together by by parties, and you make who make new inventions without uh, needing permission from from others. 
third critical property, decentralized uh, routing, uh, 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 decentralized routing uh, and, uh, and management. Um, there again, no centrality on the internet. Uh, networks make their own decisions. Uh, networks make their own economic decisions and and the only thing that they they are bound to do and 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 sort of have a commitment towards each other is to work forward packets that are not intended for them to to closer to the destination common global identifiers is the fourth critical property that's basically making sure that everybody can find each other and common global identifiers uh translates in into the dns and finally, very important, the technology neutral general purpose network. Um, the internet has not been defined to do one thing well, like voice or video, but to do many things um, uh, on, on, at a reasonable level. And that gives it its flexibility and it's it, 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 together with, with the uh, critical property of that open architecture allows us to adapt. Now, when does fragmentation happen? Fragmentation can happen if you sort of chip away from all from either of these critical properties. And fragmentation might not be a black and white thing. Um, my my boss often uses the metaphor of uh, becoming bald. Uh, that's a very slow process. You lose hairs from now and then and suddenly after years of losing hairs you look at the mirror and say oh i'm bald um but that process of fragmenting might be taking uh, tiny pieces tiny chops out of these critical properties and slowly to moving towards a less ideal um, uh, circumstance and then the question of prioritization is, of course, uh, a difficult one if you look at, look at, at, at fragmentation through that lens. Um, within that context of those critical properties, we have made an analysis kit, uh, an impact analysis kit, where uh, you look at these critical properties and see what is the impact of a, of a measure or a development on, on these critical properties. And that might also be a way by which you say, okay, the impact of this particular measure or development is very high, and that's why we need to, to prioritize, prioritize uh, something like 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 uh, like this. And I'm not going to immediately in this call say this is a priority at this moment, and that's a priority at that, uh, 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 and that's a priority. Um, there are a couple uh, of them around, but but I don't want to get into them now. I think the mechanism to prioritize them is to look at this through this analytical lens uh, of the critical properties, make an assessment, and then prioritize. And of course, addressing and the practices and the guidelines to avoid those uh, fragmentations on the technical layer is to stick and protect those critical properties. And in another part of the the internet uh, uh, impact assessment toolkit we call we talk about enablers which will help you to make the internet thrive i didn't talk about that yet but um for me the critical properties are the way that you can look at the internet and say okay this is where we are losing properties that might lead to forms of fragmentation and I, I think I leave it with that because I, I presume there will be questions and then we can we can do that in the Q&A. Certainly. Thanks. Thanks, Olaf. And um, you, you, where you pointed us to is... Um, these I'll, I'll cut and paste something in the, in the chat. Great. Thank you. These critical properties and you, you mentioned the, um, the the point uh, which I think is important and it's come through a lot of discussions on this topic, including one I attended last week um, at Eurodig about seeing this as a process, not a one-off event. Um, and you mentioned sort of different measures that can collectively or over time can lead to forms of fragmentation and the losing of these critical properties. So I think um, both for you and for Miriam, I'm gonna come to you next. Um, just wanted, and, and for everyone here, 
to 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 think about that um, and perhaps also think about what are who is taking these these little chops um, are they deliberate um, most often or not does that matter um, and um, keeping in mind that you know th there is this um, general I feel like sense of understanding that this is a process and um, that's that's uh, that's something I call on others to reflect on as well so Miria um, I want to come on to you please feel free to to introduce yourself um, and keen to hear your responses um, to these questions and if you'd like to as well react to what Olaf said um, yeah, definitely. Or maybe I would rather add to stuff that Olo said because they provided a really good summary and some important points. Um, so first of all, my name is Mia Kulevind. Um, I'm in my day job. I'm working as a researcher for Ericsson. Um, and part of that, I'm very active in the IETF on the technical side, but I'm also part of IETF leadership and I'm sharing um, the IAB, the Internet Architecture Board at the moment. Um, the IETF is basically the major standardization organization that, which is responsible for the development and maintenance of uh, some of the major internet protocols like the IP protocol, HTTP protocol, and so on. Um, and the IEB is one of basically three leadership groups um, that um, manage um, the IETF. And the responsibility of the IEB is, as the name said, Internet Architecture Board is to provide a certain technical overview about the, the work as a whole in the IETF. So that means we do try to look what's happening in the IETF and are there any gaps and how do the different things fit together. Because similar as the internet uh, in the IETF, what we do is we develop building blocks. And these building blocks are protocols that everybody can deploy differently and that contains then the internet. That means if we talk about the internet of a network of networks, it doesn't mean that all these networks look exactly the same, deploy exactly the same protocols, but they have one common thing, they are connected to each other. And if that part breaks, that's where we have fragmentation, where on the lower layer, you cannot communicate and connect to each other anymore. Um, and I think the risk that this can happen is because the internet is not a static thing. The internet is evolving continuously. We are adding new protocols all the time. We are changing the existing protocols. We are extending them. We're removing stuff. We are maintaining them. And whenever we introduce something on top of the internet or on the internet or any kind of restrictions on the internet where this evolvability is not possible anymore, that's the part where we risk um, fragmentation. And that's the part where um, you know, one network that is currently connected to the internet or we believe is connected to the internet might not be able to like take the same evolution as other networks and at some point might not be able to communicate anymore. So, um, and I think this is also kind of uh, talking about guidelines and principles. Whenever we, we talk about the internet, we have to understand that the internet is not a fixed thing. And we have to understand that what we do uh, needs to adapt to whatever the internet does, because that is actually the success of the internet, that because it can evolve, it was able to adapt to all kinds of different requirements we have. And that's why we see new services coming up and we see all these things, great things that the internet provides to us as an underlying network. So it's important to figure out or to keep in mind that the internet is changing continuously and um, to follow these changes and to adapt to these changes and not putting anything in the internet that can risk uh, restrict this evolution of the internet because that's the point where i think we risk that not only the internet is fragmented but also the internet cannot evolve anymore and cannot provide uh, a communication platform for new services anymore and that's the whole value of this whole infrastructure Um, so, Mary, did you did you want to add anything else, or do you want to leave it there for now? Um, no, I think I'll leave it there for now. I'm not sure I answered all your questions <laughs> concretely, but I, I guess the discussion will come back to this point eventually. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. So, um, some of the points that you mentioned, both you and Olaf, were around um, changes um, to um, the way the internet's evolving that could result in, um, at the lower level, um, in, in, those critical properties, that ability to communicate and connect, not being able to to actually happen. Um, so I was wondering, and I could throw it to you, um, if that's okay, both of you or to anyone else, um, as we are thinking about, uh, as I said, the the pro the fact that this could be a process um, and something that you don't realize until perhaps it's 
it's too late. Um, what are the kind of, why are we talking about this now? What are the kinds of examples and where are they coming from? Are they coming from policymakers or elsewhere that are resulting in, um, in these uh, potential threats or chips at or chopping at the critical properties that you mentioned, Olaf? Is it, um, is it, is it regulatory um, threats? Is it, um, for example, uh, I'm just throwing things out there. I'm not saying these are examples, but um, these are things that we people have recently discussed. Um, for example, um, proposals for require um, um, what are normally called sender pay proposals, for example, that that would um, change how um, uh, who is sharing what um, data and how and, and, and reduce the interoperability of data flows? Um, is it uh, sort of sanctions um, and, and the intentional disruption um, or disconnection of, of physical infrastructure? Um, is, it, um, is it shifts in edge computing? You know, so just, just some examples out there um, that I, as I said, are, are not um, agreed uh, to everyone, but are these examples of the chipping away at the critical properties that you mentioned? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I think you you hit the nail on the head there. Uh, in fact, we did uh, uh, an impact assessment on the sender pace in uh, in um, in Korea, in South Korea, there was a, 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 a sender pace rule introduced, uh, just like, the one that is now being discussed all over Europe and also in Brazil. And um, this bad idea is uh, coming up uh, across the globe, I would uh, almost say. Um, but what you see there is in fact uh, uh, that you're not treating, and that's a, uh, the impact on the, this is really where you can directly see that the critical property is being impacted. Namely the fact that uh, the network is not treated as a technology neutral general purpose network, but that some packets apparently are more important uh, uh, than other packets. Um, users that uh, request packets from uh, 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 and generate flows by uh, watching uh, YouTube content or going to Amazon or using specific cloud infrastructure um, uh, cause those packets to be uh, taxed in some way. Uh, either directly or uh, 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 in, 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 in business relationships, so to speak. Um, forced through a regulatory framework. Um, and, and that immediately impacts that general purpose network, but it also impacts the decentralized routing infrastructure because you sort of impose a centralized uh, uh, decision-making on, on that decentralized network and say you specific network over here have to deal with that specific network over there in a certain way. And what you can then see is that the market also uh, responds to that um, in an internet way. Uh, if you look at what happened in Korea, you saw uh, 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 over the top providers moving out of Korea and putting their infrastructure, not at the internet exchanges that were close to the Korean consumers, but in uh, in in Japan, where they were not hurt by these uh, uh, regulation and didn't have to pay uh, uh, the peering fees that were imposed. So uh, these are things that have an immediate impact, um, uh, I would say, and and maybe this is not fragmenting. Uh, one could argue that uh, there is a fragmenting in in uh, quality of service because in in Korea the uh, je uh, the the service providers moved to um, uh, uh, to Japan. so that's uh, evidently loss of uh, quality of service. Um, uh, and and one could say that is a fragmentary effect. Uh, some people having better networks than others. Now that's there are many reasons for that to, to happen, but um, yeah, that's one. Uh, you had another example, but um, let, let me first let me first mm -hmm. give room to others to to perhaps respond. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I would I would like to uh, add a point that you just made implicitly, and that is that the internet is a global uh, system, right? And like, fortunately, the internet has to be very resilient to any kind of um, national enforcements or whatever. 
Uh, and as you said, like in Korea, you, you saw that like um, economics businesses moved outside of the country. So it just it had like the Internet itself was resilient in some way because it has this opportunity. Um, but I think there is a risk that um, certain regulations or enforcements can actually get to the point where like the Internet breaks apart and this resilient doesn't exist anymore. Luckily, we haven't seen it yet. And what I also would like to add, I think if we, when we see um, these kind of um, implications on the internet, regulation based or whatever, it's often a misunderstanding about how the technology works uh, and and what the principles are that the that the internet is built on that cannot be changed otherwise it would not be the internet anymore. And that's why I said like first of all, there's an assumption like there's not a good understanding that the internet is continuously evolving and changing. Um, and here I would like to give another example. Um, so there has been uh, a, a case only like half a year ago, a few months ago, where a country has a system, IP-based blocking system in place to protect copyright. So protecting copyright is not a bad thing, that's all fine. Um, however, making it reliant on IP addresses in the current world is not really helpful because IP addresses are not necessarily a meaningful identifier. So what happened is that somebody hosted content on Cloudflare and somehow a Cloudflare IP address got into the system, was blocked. And that means uh, the users of this country didn't have access to many Cloudflare services over an occasion of a few hours or a day or something, which was completely unintended. And that is because there is kind of this lack of understanding. So um, I don't expect everybody to understand the internet at a full. Maybe nobody does in the world, I don't know. Um, but it doesn't help to have these kind of regulations, especially regulations that are kind of meant to be permanent, right? This is not something that you put in place today and then remove tomorrow. Um, if they are um, addressing these kind of lower layer technologies, because that has a risk to actually break things. Thank you for that example. And I think it goes to um, a point that ke it keeps being uh, made, not just in the policy network webinars that we've had, but also elsewhere. Um, as I mentioned, there was the discussions last week at Eurodic, but there have also been others, many others, about the both um, existence of intended um, actions that, that have um, effects, um, fragmentary effects and both un unintended, um, which could result from lack of understanding about how the internet works um, or you know, lack of communication between different stakeholders, et cetera. Um, so I, I think those are, you know, that's something that's definitely come through. Um, so, so far we've discussed how these um, threats um, be part of a process that could lead to a um, fragmented internet um, and the technical layer being fragmented, what that would mean about um, the impact on the on the critical properties of the internet that you mentioned, Olaf Isaac has done so much work on. Um, and um, this point about both unintended and intended um, effects. Um, there is a mention here on the chat about EU's cloud cybersecurity standards. And Mary, you mentioned that there, the internet's evolving and um, presumably um, addressing cybersecurity um, uh, is, is part of part of that. Um, this is a, a, Michael, you don't have to take the floor or anything, but I'm just, um, just a, a expressing what's in the chat um, discussion about, which links to what you were saying about, you know, actual changes do need to be made or evolutions, regulatory, um, um, evolutions are happening as well as uh, those um, that, that do need to happen um, for the internet to evolve. But is this an example of um, regulation that can have an impact on the technical layer in a way that would be part of that process leading to fragmentation? I'm not sure if anybody wants to take that or perhaps write another example. If I can just add to that, uh, I'd be fascinated mm. to know whether our speakers think that that proposal is going to go anywhere. I mean, it's it's not just the internet, obviously, it's also the cloud, but a lot of the proposal does focus on keeping the bits inside the country. And <clears throat> it's, it's, it's really disingenuous because it's all about sovereignty and it sounds good politically, but... Um, I, I I worry that um, we're not paying enough attention to it, and maybe I can be assured that it's not going to go anywhere. 
and Shital, sorry, I know that Jake Chanchin uh, has his hand up, but it's a double finger on this. I think that it will be very important for this group and for all the organizations that are thinking of technical fragmentation to also really define what they mean by technical fragmentation. What I'm trying to say is that I think that there is an overlap in the way we communicate and we say those things because a lot of the internet currently is happening through the cloud or through privatized networks or through <laughs> specialized networks and how this also impacts the public internet and the fragmentation of the public internet will be very important because for a lot of policymakers, they say, oh, but I'm doing X on the cloud. So it's not really the internet or is it the internet? So I think that we really need to advance our thinking of when we're talking about technical fragmentation uh, as to exactly what we mean uh, in the context of all those uh, new technologies that are emerging and everybody's using them. Great, thank you. Um, and just to note that um, in the the last uh, the report from the last year, um, we we noted that um, discussions generally, uh, well, some of them referred to fragmentation of the technical layer caused by interference with the public core of the internet. I'm not sure if that's what you're referring to there, Constantinos, but um, the we recognize that it's not universally defined, but there may that might be a useful reference point for when we're talking about um, technical layer fragmentation and, and the public internet. Not sure if you want to respond to that point or indeed anyone wants to add to that, but just um, in the interest of putting some common denominators of, or references into the discussion. Um, I, I thought I would add that. Um, and then I think we have, um, yes, we have Yip, Yip Chan Chin. Would you like to come in? Yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry. Yeah, I think uh, I was uh, just uh, want to follow up because the, the, uh, the last speaker's uh, comment and the privatization of the technical standard. I think we, we, last year we, we had a quite uh, uh, debate about whether the private actor should be should be allowed or do they have a legitimate power you know to have a like kind of the you know impose sanctions you know on different uh, 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 infrastructures operators especially for the uh, backbone operator which he impose the sanctions you know i think most of people have attended a seminar debate on the technical sanctions you know so I think that is a very uh, significant movement in terms of the internet fragmentation, the public internet core, and the connectivities, interconnectivities. So, so uh, many colleagues I uh, have been talking about uh, keeping in touch with are quite a worry about that this may happen uh, again in the future because we have we, we have been seeing all these uh, conflict, you know, geopolitical conflicts going on. So I think that is a kind of a uh, very important aspect we need to also concern, which is also a kind of, the, you know, follow up the previous speaker's point about privatization of the infrastructure sanctions. Yeah, just my one comment, uh, one uh, thought. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so that from that, it, it does sound like there's, um, there is this um, element of the discussion around the impact um, of, um, of private actors, um, particularly um, perhaps large ones and, and that on the, on, on the internet. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to pick that up and, and the fragmentation impacts that could, that could have. Um, again, um, there's some discussion about um, the, EU legislation in the in the chat as well. Um, so just uh, taking it back perhaps to to that, but situating it in this discussion of um, it being a process um, and also understanding that with the other elements of the policy networks framework being user experience and internet governance, we do understand there's intersections between all of these different areas. And it sounds like there is um, there is an, an impact on both uh, what policymakers are doing and um, private actors on the, or could there could be on the technical layer. Um, and Constantinus, you asked us to think about specifically what we're referring to when we talk about 
the public internet. Is there anyone who wants to speak to any of those points here? I'm just gonna look at the chat. Um, Henriette's asking, does this common understanding of the public core matter? Um, does anybody want to speak to that? Do you think that would be useful for this discussion about what we're trying to protect when it well, comes to the technical layer? Yeah, yeah. There's, there's, there's something that I, I, I probably can say uh, in the context of uh, both the public core as well as sanctions. Um, I, I, you know, I, I, I think that uh, uh, specifically sanctions by, for instance, uh, 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 transit providers can actually lead to fragmentation. Um, that 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 is a, a thing I personally frown upon. Um, but often uh, these private parties are forced to do this by uh, national sanction legislation or regional sanction sanction uh, legislation, and it's not something that they uh, impose out of their free will. Um, now, one of the things that one can argue is that there are a number of organizations that are critical for the function of the functioning of the internet. Think about regional internet registries and ICANN. Um, it would be a good confidence building measure if uh, those type of organizations would be uh, left out of uh, of sanction regimes. And. Uh, one of the things that I, I uh, actually like uh, seeing in the uh, Dutch international cyber strategy uh, uh, that, that was published by the Dutch government a couple of weeks ago is that they, uh, they, they actually have a paragraph on this. Uh, they have a paragraph of exploring ways on how these type of organizations that are critical for the proper quarter can kept out of uh, sanction regimes. Of course, I'm paraphrasing this. Uh, the uh, strategy is in Dutch. Um, it's the Dutch government that wrote that, but that, and it's not, you know, not my strategy, but that's a paragraph that resonates a lot with, you know, the public core, preventing fragmentation because if you if you impact with sanctions these uh organizations that actually manage the internet infrastructure uh uh in a, in a global way yes then you immediately have fragmentation effects so, so that to me that's 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 a hopeful sign that this is uh, getting on the agenda of nation states yeah and i i would like to add something to that because fragmentation i think is clearly a risk uh, sanctions is clearly a risk fragmentation because that's the whole purpose of sanctions, right? You kind of want to s separate people <laughs> or like nation states in this case. Um, and I do hope or I believe that maybe the lesson learned from last year is that the value of the internet actually connecting people and providing people access to information is much higher um, than the risk when you when you detach a whole country or part of the of the world. From, from this global system. So I believe that is a lesson learned and that's not only a lesson learned by, uh, I hope some of the Western states, but uh, I think when we look at, at um, what happens in the censorship world, we also see that um, more and more countries realize that the internet is such a critical infrastructure for their society and for the economy that they cannot just shut it down, right? So we see that censorship techniques become much more advanced, trying to be more targeted. I mean, I'm not saying it's a good thing, but we see that people are realizing that there is not an option to just deconnect somebody from the internet because it's a global system and it has this high value. Um, so that gives me a, a certain hope, but it also means that um, even so we don't use the internet itself, as a weapon or a tool in sanctions. Of course, what we also have seen last year is that sanctions on the economic level can have an impact on the internet. Um, uh, Olaf just mentioned kind of um, registrars very directly, but also if you look at industry, you know, if those companies that sell internet infrastructure or maintain and build internet infrastructure are not able to do business in certain countries anymore, that might actually have consequences on the internet and the connectivity in that country as well. So we we cannot we should not only use it, not use the tool the internet as a tool for sanctions, but we also have to be very careful in sanctions to not have these unintended consequences because the the internet is such a valuable tool 
I think, to, to realize some of the, the values and the goals we have on a global scale. Absolutely. Thanks, Maria. Um, and I think that that, you know, that point about sanctions also is, is, is very useful in, in terms of illustrating um, the, um, the both perhaps unintended consequences in some cases um, of a measure act intended to achieve a certain, um, a certain result um which can have other impacts and um you made a recommendation there Olaf about exempting um RIRs from that but you know I think that's we can pull out a higher level point of course about about the importance of considering um the impact of any measure on on the internet its critical properties and all all of the elements that you just mentioned and and we had also put in the chat do we know what we don't want to fragment. Um, and I think one of the aims of this discussion is certainly to get us to um, a closer collective idea um, and not just an assumed idea um, or understanding of what, what that is. Um, that's why I, I threw in um, the, the public core um, concept uh, into, the, into the discussion. But any anyone else who wants to speak to that point um, is very welcome to about what are we trying not to fragment? And what are some examples of the, um, the process that can lead to fragmentation in both the unintended and in, intended um, results of, of measures uh, that are taken either by private actors or policymakers? So I can see a hand up here. I'm just going to come to that. Um, Henriette? Um, thank you, um, Chital. Anriet Esterhuisen here from um, APC. I'm in South Africa. Um, um, it's Well, thank you for reviving the public core um, um, discussion, you know, as, as Olaf and myself were involved in developing that, that, that um, norm. But I think maybe reviving it, and I mean, we, it has an interesting history as well, but I think it is useful to think about it in the context of um, fragmentation, because I think it was very much conceived and the norm to protect it, you know, was conceived um, as a, as a, um, a measure to unify the, the internet. But I have a question which just occurred to me as I was listening to you. Is everyone using TCPIP and the internet? Does um, the international financial system, for example, do banks have alternative infrastructures um, that they use or backup infrastructures um, that they use for financial transactions? You know, do humanitarian response organizations, do they have alternative infrastructures? I'm just wondering because, you know, if, if everyone has now fully moved on to the internet or whether there are any sort of um, backup, and do the military use the internet or do they have alternative um, network infrastructures? It just suddenly occurred to me um, that I don't know the answer to that. So if anyone does, um, it would be interesting to know. I, I can I cannot full, shed a full light on that, uh, Henriette. Um, uh, I, uh, I, uh, I thought you were asking, a, a, by the way, a uh, rhetorical question with uh, the understanding of what the public core is. We could discuss that later. Um, there are no doubt specialist networks for specialist functions. Um, people build networks for uh, uh, flash trading. Those are specialized networks with no protocol overhead whatsoever. There are specialized networks, research and education networks to pump gigantic amounts of data across the globe uh, from uh, uh, astronomical telescopes. Um, so there is all kinds of uh, specialist networks to um, ship data across the world. There are factories that have quality of service requirements to operate robots, to build cars, to name something. Um, they might use the same layer too. They actually might also use IP, but they're completely separated from the rest of the internet. The internet is this general purpose uh, technology neutral network that connects us all, that creates an internet by which we internet and that uses internet protocols, but it's not the only 
place in the world where those protocols are 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 used. Um, so I hope that answers your question somewhat, Henriette. I'm not sure. Um, thank you. Well, um, I'm looking at the chat just to make sure that we are integrating um, that discussion there. Um, so the the idea of a public core um, is is contested or or not um, perhaps doesn't have the any any consensus. I'm just wondering is that something that people feel is an obstacle um, to to addressing? Um, any threats to the internet's critical properties that you mentioned, Olaf, um, or this potential pro, um, what could be a process towards more fragmented internet, um, or is it still useful in its current in its current form, you know, various formulations um, and ways that it's it's uh, understood by different actors? Um, any thoughts on on that? Um, would be i think useful to share um and any other any other views um so so, so on, on that on yeah. that particular point and i see that jake has her has her hand on uh hand up um but on that particular point the public core i indeed understand that there are uh places where uh uh Public in public core is understood as uh, public infrastructure versus private infrastructure, and that's not the intent. Um, uh, it's more like a public global commons, you, you can think of it. But even stepping away from that discussion, uh, the Global Commission uh, uh, has written what they entail in, in broad terms, uh, the public core to be. That's the network, the routing, the numbering, the naming, and the encryption infrastructure that is needed under sea cables that are needed to create the internet experience as, as we all encounter it. And if you step back and look at that definition and say, okay, this is the type of stuff that we need to protect, I think it covers pretty much everything. And it's not only IP, it's not only routing. There are other pieces that become part of infrastructure slowly. Take, for instance, uh, uh, the way that we all authenticate ourselves to websites. Nowadays, that is done by uh, uh, identity providers like uh, GitHub or Google or Microsoft, where you, uh, with a protocol called OAuth, authenticate you know you you get to a website you have to type in your uh, password you go to another website and then are brought back and then are uh, uh, are authenticated um that's at some point becomes part of the infrastructure whether we want that or not that's a different question but at some point it becomes part of this this whole technical infrastructure where if we fragment it uh make it unavailable uh disrupt it it will disrupt our internet experience and might actually fragment it. Um, it might very well be that at some point, people who cannot get to GitHub are not able to authenticate to the rest, to a large section of, uh, of say, developer websites in the world, because uh, GitHub is often used as an authentication uh, uh, identity provider for those websites. And that would be a bad thing, I think. Yeah, I, I think uh, just to, to follow up the uh, uh, the public call debate, I think uh, uh, as uh, both the Irita and Ovo just mentioned, the Global uh, Commission on Stability of Internet have already published the definition, the paper on the public call many years ago. Uh, but uh, just uh, we, uh, if we look at the definition, it's quite a board, you know, just. Uh, 
of just mentioned is including the apps as well, application layer, just like an event of an ICT certificate is part of it. So therefore, I think at the moment, uh, there's no consensus uh, globally about the definition and uh, of the, what is a public core. I think this is a very crucial element for the fragmentation at the moment, you know, do we accept uh, uh, the, the, the definition which the global uh, commission, the stability, uh, last time I talked to the o o officer there, they think this is illegally binding, should be legally binding, you know. So when we need something which is not only uh, uh, on the paper, we probably is a, a code of conduct, or even is a, a part of the binding, you know, uh, definition, uh, which can be applicable, applied, uh, uh, have a binding effect, whether by voluntarily, you know, commit to uh, follow that definition, but uh, at the first uh, at, uh, first stage, we we need to have a consensus or broader discussion about the substance of what is a public core. Whether we everybody every country jurisdiction accept the definition of global commissions, and I think uh, that that is also co co consistent, co uh, kind of the you know if you look at the the, the, the recent uh, the uh, the UN's global digital impact uh, report. Uh, the UN Secretary is also mentioned about uh, what is a global comment, you know, what is a global public good. And there's uh, so many overlapping definitions about what is a global comment, whether we should treat the internet as a global comment. And different jurisdictions have a different country, have different uh, opinion on why the internet belongs to global comment. So then the UN proposed a concept of global public good. And whether the infrastructure should be belonged to the global public good, and what part of the infrastructure should be belong to that public good, you know, I, I totally agree to the idea, uh, support the idea of global public good. But we need to uh, pin down the what substance of the infrastructure belongs to the public good. I think that's a kind of very urgent uh, task we need to, uh, if we want to move the debate or, or, or any policy forward. Uh, because as I understand, you know, my colleagues in different countries, because I'm based now, I'm in UK, uh, but before I was in China. So a different group have a different understanding of what is a public good, what is public common, what is a public core. Uh, so I think that that is something we need to sort it out. Thank you. Yeah, um, I, I, I think on the one hand, having this discussion about the public core is a good thing because it... Um, really points out that it's not only about um, you know the lower layer routing or whatever it's like much bigger part of the infrastructure like the dns system the um, certification system the identifying system that consists that is part of like what needs to be protected and that's part of that provides the infrastructure and makes the services on top of the internet work um, but i think the challenge that like we don't have a definition of it is also because this is not a fixed thing and we shouldn't think about it as a fixed thing right this is continuously evolving and we need to adapt to it and there might be new components that show up, or there might be like services that are then provided in a different way or whatever. So I, I believe that is a challenge that we have here. And I see see it as a risk also if we if we define this public core too closely and you know this is the thing that we decide we need to protect, then we can never change it again. So that is a, that is a situation we should not end up in. Uh, yes. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Miria. Um I I do have to leave in a few minutes for another call and Bruno will be um, facilitating us. Um, but I just wanted to note that your point about um, the public core being a useful reference point, um, but also the need to caution against being too um, restrictive in that, in that um, in a definition or ensuring that there's a, a really a, uh, understanding at the heart of it that it's evolving, some way of, a, of addressing that um, in, in future discussions about the public core would be helpful. Um, and I'm, I'm just saying that because um, in reflecting on the last hour or so of discussions, it seems like what I, what I put in the chat is a summary so far being two parts, really. One is that there are critical properties of the internet, possibly a threat that would move it away from being technology neutral and general purpose. Um, and second, um, these come from both unintended and intended measures or actions or measures that have that are intended, like perhaps sanctions that have unintended effects or broader effects than are intended. Um, and that this is this is a this is what um 
needs to be addressed. One possible recommendation is to move more forward with or, or have um, greater socialization of the, um, the understanding or the discussion of what is equipped for with the view to or with that caution of ensuring that it's it's flexible. These are just ways to move forward. Um, I'm not um, I'm um, signaling that this is the only way. It's just a, a summary from where I understand we have come to. Uh, but if there's anything else anyone wants to add to that, or if you think that's an interesting way we could we could go move forward, that would be good to hear from you all. Um, just going to look at the. the I have a friendly amendment to, uh, yes, to what you're just <laughs> proposing. You said uh, a moving away from the general purpose uh, uh, network uh, and neutrality. Um, I, the, the friendly amendment is this, that uh, moving away from any of these critical properties um, is a sign of, uh, is, is a threat to the internet, I would say. Um, so uh, you are picking one, of the critical properties, I think moving away from any of them is a is a sign. Okay, noted. Thank you. Um, see, some another other agreements. The definitions need to be flexible and not um, prone to ossification. Um, also, a comment um, about the need for some kind of common taxonomy. Um, to be public or be further debated. Um, also note that digital public infrastructure and public goods, I believe, um, is referenced in the Secretary General's paper on the digital compact, but not defined. Um, so it is something that is coming up. Um, okay, why then you mentioned that the UN's use includes digital public infrastructure and public goods. Don't know if you would like to speak to that or the, the value of, um, a common uh, taxonomy, perhaps. Um, but I'm I'm going to hand it over, Bruna. Is that okay to you um, to discuss next steps uh, or or to continue this discussion? Um, as I I do have to drop off, and um, this will be available for replay for for others who have to. Um, but I hope that some of you can stay to discuss um, for the next thirty minutes. Thanks, Bruna. Are you thanks, Tom. Yeah, I'm around. I, I can stick around for a little longer. That's perfectly fine. Um, well, I just wanted to ask like, whether everybody has anything to add on this as well, because I do think some of the points that um, just as Chital was like, summarizing, some of the points are really relevant, especially maybe on these over, like, um, over section, like somehow between the public core and the, and the, the entire discussions on digital commons, maybe as one of the um, last kind of like the most, one of the concepts around the Global Digital Compact where people kind of have or had doubts about. So, I mean, I'm opening the floor as well if anyone wants to, to jump in again or add any last thoughts or ideas about the discussions we had. If not, <laughs> Then I think we can maybe um, discuss a little bit of um, next steps. I guess our entire idea for the thematic webinars was to, was to kind of like kickstart or even dive a little bit deeper into some of the, the baskets that we created um, as part of the, the PNIF framework. And um, moving forward, we would like to maybe start like writing or um, just trying starting to address some of these discussions. I know like some differentiations or even like scoping of the discussions, they need to be to be done a little bit. And I, I take the point um, both from KK and Onhiet about like maybe streamlining the definition of the public core or bringing that up again, or even um, trying to set up a better definition for what is um, technical fragmentation. But maybe a question to everybody like, is there any other concept or discussion that you feel um, should be better translated or described into um, a possible report for the PNIF this year, other than the public core discussion and a definition of the of the technical fragmentation? And I get the point about the definitions not being too narrow, um, since we don't want to keep it keep keep the debates um, to like close up. 
but just like asking about any other topics. And I see um, the global public goods um, discussions here as well. So yeah, anything else or ideas you guys can just type in the chat or just write to us as well. Um, thinking about as well the lead up to Kyoto and, and to the IGF, um, would you guys have in mind any ideas of what could be a, a useful output um, for this debate? Or like what could be a useful document for the PNIF to put out um, before the forum and as kind of a preparation or background document for the discussions? If anyone had, has thoughts or ideas on that, that would be super welcome. Yeah, so maybe one point. Um, I think the current document is mainly trying to define fragmentation, which <laughs> is or has been a challenge in itself, and to measure fragmentation. Um, but I think maybe the more important point, and that's some of the things that we discussed today, is to have a better understanding what can cause fragmentation. Of course, you have to understand what fragmentation is first, but also knowing that fragmentation can be very broad and that it's a process, it's also important to identify those things that um, impact this process and that are driving um, fragmentation or techniques that can lead to further fragmentation into effectively the wrong direction. Because I think there is, and this is like the whole discussion about the public core as well, there is a very good agreement and understanding of the importance of the internet. And so, so the question is not only how do we figure out how fragmented is the internet, but it's more important to figure out how can we protect the internet to not getting entirely fragmented. Yeah, if I may add to that, Mary, I think that's that's excellent. Um, because any proposition that would fragment the internet tomorrow would be met with resistance, fierce resistance mm -hmm. at this moment. I'm, I'm pretty sure of that. But there are proposals that nibble away at the capacity and have potential long-term fragmentary effects. They nibble away from those critical properties. I think those are the, the, the tricky ones. And so assessing policies on whether that happens, I think is of critical importance. Um, so that's an assessment against those critical properties that you have to make um, so that you know that you're not growing bold. Thanks, Olaf. Thanks, Miriam. That's, that's um, really good indeed in terms of how we're going to move forward in terms of this. I think the whole chat about um, definitions was always kind of a, a, a relevant concern for, for us as well, because um, we didn't want to close up. And we know some of these debates have been going on for a while now, even though um, the internet is still somehow evolving. So we, we really don't, don't want to like be closed up in the definitions talk and and I do agree with you Megan made it that um, the whole debate on what could be the examples or even um, what can cause fragmentation in the end of the day can be a much more helpful um, debate and like in the back chat somehow um, Chital women myself have been also discussing like what could be the some of the examples that sometimes they put one or two baskets together or even like it, it's something that could be technical fragmentation that causes um, a result to the user experience in the end of the day or the other way around. So um, kind of like finding down um, the examples could be a really relevant exercise for us. And I'm also seeing Ariette's comments about um, outlining what we don't want rather than what we do want um, and looking at risks and long-term effects um, and the unintended effects. So I'm also taking this point. Um, Anyone else that would like to jump in on this? <clears throat> okay. Then I guess we start to move on towards the, the end of the call. And I see some people um, have already left, but maybe um, it's where we ask that that's the point where we ask for some volunteers and, and just, just to check, double check whether anyone would like to also help with this work. Um, you don't need to be pen holders or anything, but maybe just like helping us have a, a more comprehensive map of the risks or some of the effects intended or unintended. It's something that could be helpful either from the point of your organizations or as an individual volunteer 
So if anyone else would like to help with this work, like just please flag it um, to us or maybe afterwards on the list. I see Yuja, thank you a lot. And um, yeah, if anyone else feels like doing it too, um, it's super easy and open for everybody. In terms of, <laughs> thanks Alexander. Too. Okay, perfect. We have a few volunteers, that's really good. Um, and I do, I do have some of our speakers in our list as well, so that's great. Um, in terms of timeline, I don't know, Wim, should we um, start defining one or, because I assume a lot of us are gonna take, or a few of us should take breaks for summer, but we do have um, a smaller timeline this year, right? In light of the IGF um, being in early October. So I just wanted to ask you about timelines and whether we have a clear picture on that one. Um, sorry, yeah. Again, well, in concrete timelines, we we don't. Well, the next point we have on the uh, on our agenda is that uh, somewhere next week we we come and sit together to evaluate uh, all the the I mean huge amount of information we have collected in the uh, the dream uh, webinars, and then we uh, we need to. Uh, uh, to come up with a plan to move forward and and thank you very much, I think, therefore, it was. Um, one uh, very important question, Bruna, you asked uh, to, to understand also from the, the people in the room what could be useful, because that's actually what we are looking at. We have organized those three webinars um, to, uh, let's say, further and, and better understand uh, the, different, uh, the, different the different concepts we identified last year. Uh, the question now is uh, what can be useful um, to and, and and possible to come up with in a, by uh, almost afraid to say it by uh, two months and a half, uh, so just a bit in time for for Kyoto. So that's something we really need to uh, uh, need to focus on, and um, because that's our overall that uh, timeline. So we we definitely need to have some. Um, yeah, something more or less consolidated uh, two or three weeks by the middle of September. Um, but we started the discussion today um, and next week we're gonna have to discuss how to move forward. But in if in, uh, in the meantime there are ideas, I think it's very relevant to, uh, uh, to hear. Exactly. So any further ideas or even like if any of your organizations is developing a new tool or anything you would like for the PNIF to also kind of like help highlight that um, could be like a contribution in terms of identifying the risks and the issues or the effects on the internet, um, please flag it to us or just send us a note or a message. We'll be happy to, to discuss this further on. And I'm seeing like, um, a question, oh yeah, another question from Monhead. Um, will this risk be focused on the fragmentation of the technical layer specifically? I think that's up for discussion on yet. Um, some of like in, in previous um, webinars, we have also um, touched upon a little bit on this debate on whether or not it would be possible to identify um, what would be the risks for the user experience or the for the fragmentation of processes um, on itself. So maybe we can use um, the risks talk as kind of a streamlined approach for each of the baskets, but I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know how others would feel about this. And, and maybe we can, once we have kind of a, a more structured um, note and even like a, an appro a proper approach in terms of the risks, maybe we can further discuss this with everybody. Um, but I, I am not against it being like streamlined for, for a lot of the other debates. And yes, to, to cross um, working group discussions as well as then. Thanks for reminding me of that. Yeah, I think because uh, I'm also in the user experience or subgroup of fragmentation and network. I think it, it's better if we can you know, focus on a technical layer because the, the other group will look at uh, the user experience. 
Yeah, we do not want to because that's a, I also have a several uh, 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 team working on that. So we do not want to overlap the efforts. No, thank you. Yes, of course. Thanks, Nikchan. Uh, I think maybe as a next step um, could be for us to have a call between the working groups that were assembled, just so they could have kind of like just a very quick checkpoint in terms of where the work is heading and some of the discussions, just so it doesn't overlap. And um, and, and and as an opportunity for us to assess whether we can use this as a overarching kind of streamlined approach about the risks and everything else. So um, we're gonna probably send you, all, everybody that's on the, the working groups or, or has volunteered to write in some parts of the document, we can, we are definitely gonna try to organize this call. And Olaf, I'm gonna hand you the, the floor back again for, for your, AOB. Uh, if it's really AOB time, um, yes, this is a somewhat shameless plug, um, but it's relevant, I think. Um, the ultimate um, fragmentation experience that people can get is, of course, a network shutdown. And a network shutdown can uh, 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 identify itself or um, um, what's the word materialize itself as a full network shutdown so no service available whatsoever or uh, just a service blocking um, at the internet society we have developed a uh, echo uh, um, uh, econometric uh, tool to calculate what the losses are uh, of uh, shutdowns, either um, those that manifest as a, a full network shutdown or as a service uh, uh, blocking. And I'm going to paste the uh, link to that tool in the uh, in the chat because some might be uh, doing their benefits with it, either from the user experience side or from the uh, um, the uh, 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 the technical layer side. Um, it gives you a little bit of an idea of uh, what the economic effects are of uh, of shutdowns. Perfect. I, I had a feeling we were going to talk about this because I heard about it recently. So it's perfect to hear about it, Olaf. Thanks it's, a lot. It's indeed very, very new. Yeah. <laughs> I heard about it back in RightCon. So, so that's that's why. Um, any other AOBs, everybody? Um, I guess moving forward, um, when Shita and I were going to work on the notes, right? And um, have it all posted on the website of the page for the PNIF. And um, I guess that as, as part of our next steps, we need to start discussing whether this policy network is going to have a session um, at the IGF this year. Also, to organize this call between all the working groups on start diving into the report. Um, but we also promise to keep everybody on track and then like update everybody about the next steps and the deadlines and so on. So if anyone has anything else to add, then I'm opening the floor again. If not, I guess I can give everybody 15 minutes back for the day. And thanks a lot to our panelists. Um, this was a, an amazing discussion. I, I, we're all, the three of us were very happy with the webinars and um of like with how much has has came out of this debate so thanks a lot uh, media and um Ola for the debate and everybody that joined as well yeah thanks for inviting me in this interesting discussion